And now I have the honor to uh, introduce Mr. Richard Wilkinson. Mr. Richard Wilkinson is a British researcher in social inequalities in health and uh, the social determinants of health. He is Professor Emeritus of Social Epidem Epidemiology at the University of Nottingham, having retired in, nine, in 2008. He is also Honorary Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at uh, University College London and Visiting Professor at University of York. He became very famous also in our region with his book, uh, which is called Why Equality is Better for Everyone, and this is also the issue about uh, you will talk. Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. And are can you ready you to take, uh, take up the floor? Thank you, yes. So we start your lecture? Yes. Tell me, how long would you like? <laughs> I would say half an hour or three quarters of an hour. Three quarters? Yes. Just, and questions or questions within that? Well, if it is possible, questions within that, but uh, if not, uh, we will okay. see. Right. Well, thank you. I'm uh, sorry not to be with you. And I'm sorry not to speak German. Um, thank you for listening in English. Uh, I was in Switzerland uh, only a few days ago giving lectures in uh, Zurich and Basel and, and Bern, um, but uh, I couldn't stay long enough to do this um, uh, at your conference. I want to start with this picture because it shows how miserable everyone is. Uh, that picture is taken outside Oxford Street tube station in the middle of London and every single face is depressed, anxious, unhappy. Um, it's really a remarkable uh, statement that our societies have unprecedented levels of uh, luxury and comfort and yet we there's such a contrast to the material f success of our societies and the social failings. And in some respects, I think what I want to ta talk about touches on that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, my message is really a as simple as this. I found that on Google Images and I thought somebody has understood. Um, basically, what I'm going to show you again and again, is that the bigger the income differences are between rich and poor, the more of all sorts of problems a society has, has. Health problems and social problems. The next slide. Um, our book is sometimes called a theory of everything because we deal with so many um, outcomes like physical health, life expectancy, uh, mental illness, uh, drug abuse, levels of violence, teenage pregnancies, child well-being, social cohesion, uh, people's involvement in community life. But it's not a theory of everything. It's a theory of problems which are more common at the bottom of the social ladder. So although there is ill health and violence at the top of the social ladder, they are all more common at the bottom. I think most people look at those uh, problems with social gradients like that and they think that the gradient is produced by uh, social mobility, that the um, resilient move up and the vulnerable move down, the healthy move up and the unhealthy move down. But I'm going to show you that any of those problems are from between twice as common and ten times as common in the countries with bigger income differences between rich and poor. And I think what that means is that those problems are substantially responses to social status differentiation itself. So let me start though just by showing you a little bit of um, Swiss data. Um, 
these are occupational class differences in uh, people with disability pensions. Uh, simply enormous differences between the professional occupations at the top and the semi and unskilled manual occupations at the bottom. That's a, a 1 to 12 difference. <clears throat> or if you look at the next slide, uh, you can see the differences in death rates. These are for men uh, in working age, 45 to 65 years old, and that there are those differences in death rates over a 20-year period. Uh, they're pretty large. Uh, internationally, many countries have bigger uh, differences and a few have smaller. But this is a, a major human rights abuse. And of course, if we are concerned with the future of the welfare state, we should be concerned with these gross inequalities. Right, uh, I'm afraid that's almost all the, the Swiss data I have but you will see where Switzerland is in many of my international graphs. On the next slide, thank you, uh, you can see the relationship internationally between life expectancy and national income per person. Uh, what you're seeing there is it rises, life expectancy rises rapidly in the early stages of economic growth and then it levels off. Uh, it doesn't level off because we have reached the limits of human life expectancy. Uh, it is still improving as fast as at any time over the last hundred years. You know, every, uh, what, every ten years that passes, we get another two or three years life expectancy. But in the rich countries, on the top right of that curve, it is unrelated to economic growth. Uh, and what's important about that curve is that if you look at happiness or measures of well-being, it's a very similar shape. Rapid rises in the early stages of economic growth, and then it levels out. Uh, I think what we're looking at there is a curve of diminishing returns to economic growth. You know, economic growth is what's really transformed uh, the quality of our lives, but in the rich world, it's largely finished its work. Um, in the um, poorer countries, it's really important that people should have higher material standards of living. But in the rich countries, for us to have more and more of everything makes less and less difference. So, we've largely got to the end of the, the really important benefits of economic growth. I want to talk about the rich countries on the top right-hand part of that uh, graph. And uh, I hope in the next slide um, you can see that part of the graph uh, just magnified. So it's still life expectancy up the side against national income per person. These are the countries I'm going to talk about. Um, I got okay, uh, and you see on the right, countries like Norway and the USA are twice as rich as countries on the left, and it makes no difference to life expectancy at all. There's not a suggestion of a relationship there, and yet I've shown you within even within Switzerland. Uh, there are really important health differences uh, up and down the social hierarchy. On the next slide, you can see the health inequalities in England and Wales. Um, we have uh, more detailed data. These are small areas, neighbourhoods. And you can see on the right are the poorest neighbourhoods with low life expectancy and on the left are the rich neighbourhoods with high life expectancy. And those, that, those differences run right across society. If you want to understand this, it's no good thinking just about poverty, unemployment, um, homelessness. That is a contribution only to the right-hand end of that. To understand this pattern of inequality, health inequalities, 
this major human rights abuse in our societies, you have to have a reason why the people just below the top are doing less well than the people at the top. Now that's a paradox. It looks as if income or something like it is very important within our societies. But it doesn't matter apparently between the rich societies. What's going on? Why, is it, why does income matter within our societies and not between them? I think the explanation is that within our societies we're looking at the effects of social status or social position where we are in relation to, to each other uh, and how big the gaps are between us. Um, and as soon as you've got that idea that what we're looking at within our societies are the effects of relativities, of differences between us, you should start thinking what happens if we make the differences between us bigger or smaller. And that's really what I'm going to show you in this, uh, the rest of this lecture. On the next slide, uh, you can see the, the measure of health inequalities we've used. Um, it comes from the um, UN Human Development Report, and it's how much richer are the top 20% than the bottom 20%. How big is that gap within our societies? And you see in the more equal societies on the left, the top 20% is three and a half or four times as rich as the bottom 20%. But on the right, in UK, Portugal, USA, Singapore, the gap is twice as big. On that measure, we are twice as unequal as uh, countries like Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden. You can see Sweden, uh, uh, Switzerland in the middle there, the, the bright blue, um, very much in the middle of the distribution. And as you'll see in my graph, Switzerland on the, all the inequality ones, we use those figures. So Switzerland, you will see in the middle. Um, now, what we did, uh, if I can have the next slide, please, uh, is collect international data from international agencies like the World Health Organization or OECD or the World Values Surveys, we collected internationally comparable data on these outcomes with social gradients, uh, life expectancy for each country, children's maths and literacy scores in the international tests, infant mortality rates, homicide rates as a measure of violence, the proportion of the population in prison, teenage birth rates, measures of trust, how much people trust others, obesity rates, uh, mental illness, which includes in the, in the standard psychiatric diagnosis, uh, it includes uh, drug and alcohol addiction, and some figures on social mobility. So those were the figures we managed to get from international agencies on problems which have those social gradients. Um, and we put them all together in one index. And on the next slide, you can see that index. Um, we put them all together uh, into our index of health and social problems. Each of those uh, outcomes has an equal weight. So where a country is, is its sort of average performance on all those things, influenced just as much by life expectancy as by trust or social mobility. Um, and along the bottom is the measure of income inequality I've just shown you. And you see, doing badly on all those problems are the unequal countries, USA, Portugal, UK on the right, and the countries doing well are the countries with the small income differences, uh, Japan, Norway, Finland, Sweden, countries like that. But if you look, as on the next slide, um, at the uh, that same index of health and social problems, but look at it this time in relation to national income per head, Again, you see there's no relationship 
So these problems seem to be related to the gaps, the differences between us in a society, and not to the overall level of income. We were worried that people would think that, I don't know, we'd chosen this, the, these um, outcomes to suit our argument. So we thought we should look at somebody else's index. So we looked at the UNICEF, the United Nations Index of uh, Child Wellbeing in the Rich Developed Countries. It contains 40 different components. Everything to do with child well-being goes into the, the United Nations Index of uh, um, Child Well-being. There are uh, so whether children can talk to their parents, whether there is bullying in schools, how they do on these maths and literacy tests. Um, um, what else goes into it? Immunization rates. All those things uh, make up this measure of child well-being. And on the next slide, you can see it in relation to uh, that same measure um, of inequality. And what you're seeing there is the more unequal countries have lower standards of child well-being. Uh, the UK, my country, does worst on that. Um, and uh, you can see Switzerland is doing a bit better than we'd expect, but not as well as the best. In the next slide, you see that same index of child well-being, but this time in relation to gross national income. And remember, the countries on the right are twice as rich as the ones on the left, and it makes no difference to child well-being at all. Our children's charities talk about child poverty as the problem, but it's really important to distinguish between relative poverty and absolute poverty. You know, if it was absolute poverty, then we'd need more economic growth with, uh, with trickle-down. Uh, but it's not. The problem is the differences between us. The problem is how unequal are the societies in which children are growing up and how far behind the rest of us families with children are. I want now to show you some of the separate components of our index. Um, <clears throat> on the next slide, you can see a measure of trust. It's from the World Value Survey. It is simply the proportion of the population who agree that most people can be trusted. And on the right, you will see that only 15 or 20 percent of the population feel they can trust others. But on the left, in the more equal countries, it's 60 or 65 percent of the population who feel they trust others. They can trust others. If you look at measures of social capital, uh, the strength of community life, people's involvement in community life, you see exactly the same relationship. So now quite a number of, of uh, um, research papers showing this. We did all this work twice. We did it on these. Uh, um, uh, different countries, and then we repeated it to make sure it wasn't just a chance finding. We repeated it uh, on the American states. We asked just the same question, do the more unequal states do worse on all these kinds of health and social problems? And the answer is that almost everything that is related to inequality internationally was also related to inequality amongst the American states. And on the next slide, uh, you can see that same measure of trust um, uh, for the American states. This, this time it, the data comes from the, federal, the American federal government uh, uh, general social survey. Um, now, in the next slide, you see mental illness. It's not simply people going to their doctor and asking for um, antidepressants, because that would be, the figures would be too influenced by whether you have to pay to see your doctor and things like this. Uh, these figures are put together by the World Health Organization uh, using diagnostic interviews on random samples of the population. Uh, so they have uh, uh, used uh, a sets of questions that are found to be predictive of mental illness. And up the side of this graph, you have the proportion of the population with any mental illness in the preceding year. And you see at the bottom, uh, it's about 
of the population who had any mental illness in the preceding year. Uh, but countries at the top have three times as much mental illness. Uh, these measures had not yet been made in, in Switzerland and I think probably still haven't on a comparable basis by the World Health Organization. That's why there are no Swiss uh, figures in this. On the next slide, um, we have uh, infant mortality rates, a sort of, what about a twofold difference in mortality rates between uh, um, more and less equal countries. On the next slide, you see violence. These red dots are American states and the blue ones are Canadian provinces. And you see the, the figures vary from about 15 homicides per million at the bottom up to 150 homicides per million at the top. So some of these societies or states have 10 times as much violence as others. Uh, there are now about 50 papers showing that relationship between violence and inequality in different contexts. On the next slide, you can see the proportion of the population in prison, how many people are locked up in each country. And uh, up the side, you have what's called a log scale, which compresses the top. Otherwise, it would go curving up off the top of the screen. But uh, the intermediate points are harder to judge. But Japan, at the bottom left, is about 40 homicides per 100,000 population. And it goes up to about 400. So again, tenfold differences in the proportion of the people in, uh, people in prison in different countries. Part of that relationship is more crime, but most of it is harsher sentences, more punitive sentences. In more unequal countries, you are more likely to be sent to prison. Uh, and that, um, I don't know whether that's because there is more fear up and down the social hierarchy, or whether there is um, more less trust um, or less empathy but it's another indication of something going wrong in the quality of the social relations in the society. You know, as I said earlier about trust or social cohesion. On the next graph, we have teenage births. Um, really rather big differences again. Um, it's births per thousand women in their teens, and it goes from around five per thousand up to, well, in, in Britain, we have about six times that level. Um, in the USA, about 10 times that level. The next graph is the last I'm going to show of these ones, just um, pointing out how much w w less well um, more unequal countries perform. You see here, um, this is social mobility. It's an important graph because there is a tendency for people to say that more unequal countries are, are, are fair if everyone can find their right level in society. The idea that if you work hard, you move up. But what this uh, graph says is that you are, there is less social mobility in countries with bigger income differences. Uh, the measure of social mobility is just the correlation between fathers' and sons' incomes. I'm sorry, it's not mothers' and daughters', it's, it's not our data. But uh, So the USA, instead of being the land of opportunity, is the land of least opportunity. We sometimes like to say if Americans want to live the American dream rather than just dream it, dream it they should go to Denmark. Uh, and again, there are now other um, data sets showing this sort of relationship. Um, all the work I've shown you so far is very simple. But there is much more sophisticated uh, w work in the research journals, in the academic literature. Um, we don't put it in our book, though we do reference it, uh, because we were trying to... Put, present a picture which is very accessible, easy for people outside the field to understand. Um, but people have used what are called multi-level models, sophisticated statistical techniques. Uh, and in the next slide, you can see um, uh, 
changes over time. All the things I've shown you are just uh, uh, a single point of time, cross-sectional relationships, but there are papers looking at changes over time. And so in this we see changes in health come about uh, 3 to 12 years following um, a rise in, in inequality. Um, now, <clears throat> I think where this gets more relevant to a conference like yours on the future of the welfare state, if you look at the next slide, of course, the response the, in public opinion to more crime or more ill health or more social problems or more drug addiction um, is to want more services. Uh, people want more police, they want more doctors, they want, well, they don't often say they want more social workers, but, you know, we lay on all these expensive services to try and, uh, as a response uh, to this range of problems. But, of course, this service is only partially effective. Um, more police, uh, and policing is not one of the most important influences on uh, uh, levels of crime in different countries, nor relationships between doctors per head of population and, and measures of health very clear. Uh, and nobody suggests that the numbers of social workers determine uh, the scale of social problems in society. What happens, I think, is that uh, uh, we desperately try and respond to these problems, forgetting that they are being constantly recreated. We need these services. You know, some communities in the poorest areas of uh, certainly the more unequal societies, the poorest areas, uh, social life is falling to bits. We desperately need these services, but they are expensive services and we will need them as long as uh, we have great inequality and the problems are constantly being recreated. I think the most important thing the welfare state can do is to redistribute income, to narrow the differences between us. You know, going to a doctor occasionally um, or having a, an occasional policeman on the street or seeing a social worker once a week if you've got problems is not enough to change life. Uh, we have to deal with these problems at source and address the kind of social environment that is uh, creating them. I've been showing you how big the differences are between uh, um, more and less equal countries. Sometimes twofold differences, as in infant mortality, or threefold differences, as in mental illness rates, but sometimes tenfold differences, as in violence, or teenage births, or the proportion of population in prison. Because the scale of those differences in itself tells us that these um, uh, problems cannot, that inequality isn't just affecting the poor. The differences are too big uh, to be created just by a poor minority, say the poorest 10% of society. But fortunately we don't just have to rely on that sort of um, inference uh, to understand what's happening. If you go to the next slide, this comes from uh, an early attempt to compare health inequalities internationally. When we were starting to wonder, are health inequalities the same in every country? And some Swedish researchers very kindly classified uh, their infant deaths according to the British Registrar Generals, the, the, the occupational class classification that we used. It's a classification by father's occupation, uh, anachronistically, so single mothers have to be in a category on their own on the left. Uh, then the low social status father's occupations, those are unskilled manual workers. Then come semi-skilled uh, manual workers, then skilled manual, then junior non-manual, -man clerical workers and people, uh, then intermediate non-manual, teachers and nurses, and then on the right uh, hand side, the high occupations uh, are um, doctors, lawyers, directors of larger companies. 
And what you see there is that uh, Sweden has lower infant mortality all the way across society. The differences are biggest at the bottom of society, but even at the top. Uh, you see the effects, there is a small beneficial effect of uh, um, being in a more equal society. Now, we have now about six lots of data where you can see that same pattern, that uh, the social gradient becomes flatter in a more equal society, uh, the, the benefits of greater equality extend uh, right up uh, at fairly high levels in the society, but the benefits are biggest at the bottom of society. Um, the next slide shows you exactly the same uh, pattern. Um, I Can we have the next slide? Um, yes, that... Well, perhaps I'll, I'll skip it. Basically, it's showing just the same thing, that more equal countries have... Uh, uh, flatter social gradients in in this case in in children's or young people's literacy scores um, the children of well, well educated parents on the right um, do better in all countries uh, the children of badly educated parents near nearer the bottom of society are on the left and again you see in more unequal United States um, the differences are very large at the bottom of society, but even at the top, you do a little better to be in a more equal country like uh, um, Sweden or Canada than in the USA. Now, what these last two graphs are showing you is it's not saying that one country has more poor people or more badly educated people or more people in um, uh, unskilled manual occupations. It's saying that wherever you are, you do worse in more unequal societies. Um, people always want us to say even the super rich would do better in more equal societies, but actually they are a fraction of 1% of the population and we don't have data on them. You know, Undoubtedly, they do get ill and they do have violence problems, they do have drug problems, uh, but we don't have the data for them. So we can say with confidence that 90 or 95 percent of the population do better in a more equal society, uh, but we don't have data beyond that. Right, uh, on the next graph, um, you can see that... Um, uh, this is showing you the graph I, uh, where we put all the data together, the one I showed you at the beginning. Now, you've noticed in all the things I've, I've uh, shown you that it's always the same countries doing badly. This is an embarrassing lecture to give in the USA, uh, or indeed in Portugal and the UK. Um, it's always the same countries do, that do well. So it's not simply that one or two things go wrong with inequality, it's that a whole range of uh, uh, social problems uh, are, are more common. Uh, so we're looking at a kind of social dysfunction related to inequality. Um, I should also say that, you know, there are different ways of becoming more equal. So, for instance, Sweden has very large differences in income, but it narrows the gap by having high taxation and generous welfare spending. Japan, that also does well, has smaller tax differences uh, and, and smaller income differences before tax uh, and less generous welfare expenditure. And we see rather the same contrast between American states. Some of the ones that do well uh, do some redistribution and others uh, start off with small income differences before tax. Our impression is that it doesn't really matter how you become more equal as long as you get there somewhere, somehow. Um, now, the next slide, I want to say just a few words about what I think is happening. Income distribution is not a completely new uh, influence on all these problems that, we, uh, that are related to social status. In a sense, all I'm saying is that problems that we know are related to social status get worse 
when we make the social status differences more important. Um, and they get worse amongst the whole society because it changes the quality of the social fabric. You know, since before the French Revolution, people have had an intuition that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive. And in a way, I think that's what the data are telling us. And in a sense, I think the material differences between us um, determine whether we have a very steep social hierarchy with very big social differences from top to bottom or a much shallower uh, social hierarchy um, with different social relations. Um, so think of inequality as affecting um, the importance of class and status in our societies. On the next slide is another way you can uh, think about this. Um, it's in a sense whether people feel valued or devalued. It's about superiority and inferiority. And in more unequal societies, it looks as if status competition becomes more important, status insecurity becomes more important, and, and consumerism is more powerful because that's how we compete for status. Uh, I think I should move on quickly because uh, of uh, time running out. Um, one of the things about more unequal societies is that uh, where status is more important, we become more worried about how we are seen and judged, how other people, you know, whether they look up to us and admire us or whether we are looked down on and thought of as, as stupid and failures and lazy and so on. Uh, it looks as if we judge each other more by social status in, in a more unequal society. And um, uh, we see that uh, narcissism increases with inequality. Um, there's good data on that from the United States, and you can see narcissism rising in the population uh, with uh, inequality. There is also another paper published since our, our book came out um, on uh, self-aggrandizement. Uh, this is basically a study looking on at what could be called self-enhancement or self-aggrandizement uh, in relation to uh, inequality. Uh, the measure that they used is they asked people to compare themselves with the average in their society. You probably know the joke that 90% of the population think they're better drivers than average. Um, and in this study, they asked people whether they think they're more generous than average or whether they think they are uh, cleverer than average. And so on a number of criteria, uh, they get people to judge themselves where do you come in relation to the, your national average? And in more unequal countries, people rate themselves higher. Because you are more worried about how you're seen and judged, social judgments become more important. And so instead of being modest about your abilities and achievements, you become narcissistic. Um, let's change our society from that to something more like this. Um, if you want to find out more of this, uh, more about this, uh, our book has just come out in, in, well, it's out in German and in French. On the next slide, you can see that um, under different titles. Um, if you're sufficiently interested in this to want these slides or to do any campaigning, uh, the next slide gives the uh, um, web address of the Equality Trust, um, which tries to make this evidence of the effects of inequality more accessible to people. So I'll stop there, but I'm happy to uh, answer questions if, uh, if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for uh, this most in interesting uh, presentation and lecture. As you know, we are discussing here the future of the welfare state. What would be the consequences of all the diagrams you have shown? Well, I think that if we were a more equal society, if, if we reduce our inequalities, uh, it would have a major impact on a huge range of 
uh, social problems which are tend to, all the ones that tend to be more common at the bottom of society. We did a formal test of this in one paper. We looked at causes of death, some of which are related to social status and some are not. And it's definitely the problems that are more common, uh, that become more common, have those social gradients that are worse in more unequal societies. As I say, because they are responses to social status differentiation, and if we can reduce social status differences, uh, the problems of uh, status, status competition, low social status become less important and you get less of these problems. Maybe I can open the floor. As you know, we have a lot of experts here. Uh, I open the floor. Are there any questions to Richard? Yes, please. Over there. Uh, my name is Servan Gruninger. I'm not an expert. I'm a student of biology at the University of Zurich. And um, you showed us all those, like the, the worrying big number of correlations between inequality and, um, and social problems. And my question essentially is, how many parameters did you check in the beginning and what is the percentage of the significant parameters you showed us in the end? So how many parameters were you looking at in the beginning? You are suspicious. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why we looked at the, we did a paper f on the um, uh, UNICEF index of child well-being because we thought people would uh, uh, think that we'd just chosen problems to suit our argument. Um, we did look at one that we found was uh, not related to inequality, which uh, we describe in on a page in our book. Um, uh, suicide is not more common in more unequal. In it's not more common in more unequal societies. It's significantly more common in more equal societies. I'm not sure I regard that as a um, a counterexample because in many societies suicide does not have that social gradient. For instance, a very important paper um, years ago on health in Harlem in New York. Uh, at most ages, death rates were higher than in rural Bangladesh. Uh, the most important cause of excess mortality in Harlem was heart disease. But suicide was the only cause of death that was not more common in more unequal, um, uh, sorry, which was not more common in Harlem than the rest of the American, uh, rest of the United States. Um, when we looked at the UNICEF index of uh, child well-being, uh, which as I said has 40 different uh, components, one of the components is the proportion of children in relative poverty, which in a way is a bottom sensitive measure of inequality. So we took that out and looked at the remaining 39 uh, measures. Uh, we didn't want people to say this is a circular argument. So. Um, we, we, we went through all those uh, variables, they're grouped into six different components, uh, all of them are related to, significantly related to inequality. Um, you can find a, a reference to our paper in the British Medical Journal. But as I said, there are much more sophisticated analyses. Colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, have gone through meta-analyses of cohort studies looking at the effects of uh, inequality uh, and changes in inequality over deaths within cohorts that have been followed through. A meta-analysis uh, including individual data on 60 million people. Um, so you control for individual incomes and then see if there's a contextual effect of uh, income inequality over and above that, a societal effect, and they find that there is. There are now about 200 papers in the journals uh, on the relationship between uh, income inequality and population health. Uh, there are, as I said, about 50 on violence and uh, uh, inequality. There are probably a dozen on um, uh, measures of social cohesion like trust and social capital and inequality. Putnam shows in his Bowling Alone and in his earlier study of the Italian regions, his Making Democracy Work, they're both related to inequality. So maybe, this isn't just some story we've cooked up. Maybe two other questions? Yes, 
behind there, lady. Hello, my name is Vera Gertz, I'm a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, so I really enjoyed your presentation, and myself, I really liked how you presented all these facts and inequality and how we could go about it, what it's causing to societies as a whole. But I was wondering, what can we do about it? So you said that either if we had, say, more taxes to reach more equality, or we could have less income inequality at the very beginning. But if you take those societies who are at the end of your scale every single time, like Portugal, the US, partly the UK, how do you want to go from this stage to the next stage? How do you, what, what do you propose in terms of policy proposals, especially, say, for the US, where the situation seems to be so stuck, where minds seem to be made up? How do you, how do you want to get there? Well, I think one of the really important things is that an income differences have widened in so many developed countries, basically because the rich have run away from the rest of the population. Their income differences, their incomes have increased much farther, faster than the rest of the population. And I think that um, trend, uh, which has led in the U.S. between, say, 19. 70s, late 1970s or 1980 and the early 2000s to a tenfold increase in the income def differentials in the uh, top 350 American companies, uh, that is a reflection of a lack of any democratic constraint at the top. And you know in many European countries uh, there is legislation uh, for employee representatives on company boards and remuneration committees. Uh, I think we need that in, in all these countries. Uh, Britain doesn't have any provision like that. Germany, which does, has had much smaller uh, rises in income differences. I believe in Germany there are different levels of employee representation for different sized companies. When you get to 2,000 employees, half the representatives on the remuneration committees have to be employee representatives. Um, but I think we must also, and I think the next sort of stage, if you like, and this may sound rather grandiose to talk about human emancipation, but I do think we have got to extend democracy uh, into the economic sphere. Uh, by supporting uh, employee-owned companies, employee share ownership, uh, mutuals, cooperatives, uh, all those kind of companies have much smaller income differences. Uh, and they also, uh, it's said, turn companies from being pieces of property into communities. So I think that is a more, much more fundamental approach uh, to increasing equality than uh, simply redistribution through taxes and benefits. One more question, maybe? Uh, yes, maybe somebody behind, yes? It Sorry. will be very short because Madame has already mentioned the main point, what shall we do? But we shall vote. The 24th of November, we are going to have in Switzerland the vote where, which should limit to factor 12 the difference between the right, the biggest income and the lowest income. That's remarkable and quite fitting for this place. Thank you. This was not the question, this was a comment. Uh, maybe one last question. <laughs> I am the Secretary General of the Swiss Academies of the Humanities and Social Sciences and your research is quite close to that what Sir Michael Marmot has done and I think that you work together as well. And Michael Marmot has some other uh, proposition how we can get to a, to a more just society with his uh, Marmot champions so that you can do a lot of measures for young people in, 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 in Manchester or wherever you are without touching really uh, it, the income in, in con, uh, distributions or very concrete measures for, for, for people which are on the bottom of, of society, what he proposes as this uh, Marmot champions. That's one thing that you may say a word about it. And another thing, uh, you have never said anything about mentality. It could be possible that even in a society which is uh, quite equal, where the differences are very small, that you have a competition about, about who is the better one. Even if they have 
and even if the differences are, are very small, that you have a status concurrence by mentalities, and maybe this is more uh, stronger in, in the United States and in, in individual societies than in others. I, I agree that it's, it's, one can imagine that happening. Um, that um, more that there'd be still a lot of uh, competition between people, uh, even if the income differences were small. But it doesn't seem to happen. What the data tells us uh, is that actually countries with small income differences do better. And you can see that uh, not only in the studies I mentioned looking at change, um, but um, compare Japan and the United States in the post-war decades. Uh, United States used to be one of the more equal countries, you know, and, and they were glad to have got away from the f um, European uh, feudal class system, if you like. Um, and their health was, well, not the best, but still in the top five or six. They have become steadily more unequal, and they are now at the bottom of the league of life expectancy. Well, not quite the bottom, but they come in number, I don't know, 28 or something like that in the international league of life expectancy. Um, Japan uh, w did rather badly at the end of the war. It was still an unequal society, and it um, had poor health compared to other countries. But there was a massive movement in Japan for greater equality in the post-war decades. And so during the 1980s, uh, Japan became the, um, the country with the highest life expectancy in the world. Its income inequality has been increasing again, and so they may lose that position. But you see the United States and Japan sort of going in opposite directions relative to other countries. Uh, as their income distribution has moved in opposite directions. Uh, so I don't think that uh, the worry you have is, um, is likely to be borne out. I think that is partly because uh, it is the scale of income differences between us which allow us to judge whether people are on the same level as us or not. You know, we tend to choose our friends from amongst our, our near equals uh, and to feel, not to feel so uh, um, at ease with someone who are much uh, further up the hierarchy or much lower down. You mentioned Michael Marmot. I happen to be sitting in his chair now because I had to give this lecture from London. I'm using his computer. Um, I, I have to catch a, a train to Brussels um, immediately after this. Um, but yes, um, Michael's work makes... Uh, uh, on, on the psychosocial influences on health is an important underpinning uh, for what I've been talking about um, and the importance of early childhood, uh, the way, uh, which is partly now um, working through epigenetics. Epigenetics is influenced by class and status. We now know um, an increasing amount about those processes. Uh, and contributing to these differences that I've been talking about. Well, Richard, we would have a lot of more questions here, but uh, we also have to stop. I would like to thank you again very much for this uh, most in uh, interesting lecture. Uh, I was very glad that uh, it functioned with Skype, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you. Uh, you earn an applause. I hope you have heard the applause and uh, yes, have a nice you. evening. Bye-bye, Richard. Thank Bye. you.